this one um, uh, a little, I, w I wouldn't say more complex, but I'm going to try to keep it narrowly focused on talking about active communication as it pertains to sex offenders, because you can fall down that wormhole around mm. sex offender registrants and what type of notification and all, uh, all that registration um, pretty quickly. So just as a, a little refresher, um, so we've had a sex offender registry since 1996 in Vermont. Um, and there's really kind of two parts when you think about the registry. There's the registration piece, um, and then there's the notification piece. So registration is, it requires um, folks who have been uh, convicted of certain types of sex offenses, really, um, with, uh, there's very few exceptions. So I would say, in general, most sex offenses, with the exception of, of um, some very minor ones, you are required to, uh, to register with the Department of Public Safety and the Vermont Criminal Information Center, which keeps the registry. So they are the administrators of the sex offender registry. Um, and uh, so when someone is being, um, uh, let's say they're incarcerated and they're being released from confinement, um, there are requirements in current law that uh, uh, for both DOC and for the offender to be reporting information to the Department of Public Safety so that uh, DPS will have the information on its registry about where that offender will be living and what their reporting requirements are because depending on the level of sex offense, sometimes folks are only required to register for 10 years, other folks are required to register for life, so it depends on their status. Um, there could also be things, uh, there's also information on there about whether or not they're determined by Department of Corrections uh, as being a high risk sex offender because perhaps they have refused treatment. Um, so there's a lot of information that's contained on the registry, and that registry is available to all law enforcement. And so it was originally kind of contemplated as a law enforcement tool. And then over the years through like the late 90s and mid 2000s or whatever, it, the, the notification piece was really expanded in terms of, um, of both passive and active community notification. We do have a, uh, you can access the sex offender registry on online on DPS's website. There, you can. You, you can or can You can, yep. And again, that's been up for years. Does it um, give the person's address? It does not? It does um, not give the address. It gives the uh, town and the county. Uh, you'll recall that, um, or some of you well, is that a number of years ago there was uh, legislation that passed that said um, that, that they could start putting up the specific street address of offenders um, once there was a, and I can't remember the exact term, but it was essentially a, a positive audit of the registry by the auditor of accounts because um, at that time there has been a lot of inconsistencies in the registry um, and to date that that it has not yet received a positive audit so the, the addresses are not there but they are available to law enforcement um, and so but you can go on to the sex offender registry right now anyone can and uh, look up your town, look up your county. You could also put in the name of a particular person if you were looking to see whether or not that person was on the registry. Um, and so, um, so that information is all publicly available. Um, the vast majority of sex offenders are on the public internet registry and you can access them. There are some offenses that are, uh, that registrants are not on the public registry, so for something like lewd lascivious, um, so that might just be a, kind of a, uh, someone who is, uh, I'm trying to think of something, uh, somebody who groped somebody um, and that's an L and L. But if it was uh, involving a minor, that would be L and L with a child, and that's a different offense, and that is on the public registry. So any sex offenses having to do with children are on the public registry. There's another access, a way to access the other information about the other registrants, but I'm mostly going to focus on the ones who are on the public registry because that's what we're talking about in the active community community notification provision in 842. So, um, so the way that 
communification works is we talk about active and passive. Passive is just where somebody can access the information like I was just talking about. So they can go onto the website, they can look up somebody's name, they can look up a county, say, who are all the six farmers living in my town? Um, active communication is when um, law enforcement or Department of Corrections or D uh, DPS um, affirm affirmatively takes an action to either notify generally the public. Um, there were several years ago, there was kind of a, a few years there where there were some uh, high risk sex offenders who had refused treatment, who had maxed out their sentences, and um, DPS and DOC were doing some joint press releases once those offenders were uh, being released back into the, out into the community. So that's active communication. It could also be something where you have um, a sex offender who is being released from inc an incarcerated setting, and um, and then they are going to be. Um, living, let's say they're under, they're going to be under supervision, so they're going to be maybe serving their probationary sentence after being incarcerated. And DOC has approved housing for them in a particular location. Um, and for whatever reason, DOC feels as though, um, or the or or the registry, so meaning the Department of Public Safety or the local law enforcement agency, because local law enforcement always is notified that there's a sex offender moving into town because they always have to keep their address updated with the registry. Um, is any of those law enforcement folks can notify at their own discretion neighbors, employers, other folks that um, um, that this person is a registered sex offender, talk to them about the offense for which they were convicted, um, and, any, uh, and certain other information. So they have that ability, but it's discretionary. It's not mandatory. And so that was something that was debated, again, quite a bit, probably about a decade ago. And the law enforcement um, said we really want the authority to do active communication, but we don't want to be mandated. We want to take it on a case-by-case -case basis in order to kind of balance the issue of trying to say we have, you know, protection of the public here, but we're also trying to reintegrate this offender successfully back into the community. And so that's what you have, you see, in subsection A in section one. Um, so you have that the department, anytime you see this when in the sex offender statutes when it just says the department is, means DPS, so it means the sex offender registry. It, so it's either DPS, DOC, and any lo local law enforcement are authorized to notify members of the public at their discretion about any sex offender whose information is required to be posted on the internet. So I get a sex offender notification on my email, mm -hmm. and that comes from the Department of Public Safety. Yeah, you can sign up for it for those on their website. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if somebody moves into your town, into you your know. community. Yep. I, I don't get the address. Right. I don't get where. It's just it's in the community. It's a, what the person's been convicted of, whether it's high risk or low risk, moderate risk is compliant, is not compliant. Mm -hmm. They'll also they'll have information on there about if they're under supervision and if they are under supervision, which you know probation office to call if you have questions. Um, so you see the new language in subdivision two, starting on line three, is that so it's not less than 30 days prior to an offender being released from incarceration, um, DOC is to notify tenants and owners of any abutting property um, where the sex offender will reside um, uh, that the person is on the registry. And, and they're to do this at this mandatory act of communication in these circumstances. One is the offender's information has to be required to be on the internet. Um, two, the registrable offense was committed against a minor, which all of the offenses committing committed against a minor are required to be on the internet. Um, and uh, finally, the offender's not completed his or her sentence and will continue to be supervised by DOC at the residence. So DOC has approved the residence <laughs> Um, they've committed an offense against a minor. Uh, they're on the internet already. Um, so uh, this would not encompass if, let's say, somebody maxes out. Um, at that point, DOC can't control, obviously, where the offender is going to live. That person is still going to be required to, to keep all of their information, including their specific address, current with the registry. Um, 
but this provision is just saying that for people that would continue to be under DOC supervision in the community, if the person's offended against a child, then DOC must notify the abutting neighbors. Right now, they can do it. It's just on a case-by-case -case basis up to DOC whether or not they think it's appropriate. So by default, let's say that for somebody's getting out that's a sex offender, not necessarily against a, child, a minor. Mm -hmm. <coughs> But I'm assuming that a landlord would have had contact with DOC prior to renting the, the I'm just using assumption, prior to renting a, a place to stay. And yeah, if somebody, somebody's got to know where this person is going currently, uh, but that's a pretty limited number of people. So I'm, I'm a landlord, DOC comes to me and I assume he says, Joe Smith's coming out, would, would, would I, would, Maybe it's better correction. Better correction. Can you tell them what it was offense if they asked. So, are you talking about that they would be under they're under DOC supervision or they're not they're coming out under DOC supervision? Right. And so, I'm I'm Joe Smith. I'm the landlord. Your DOC comes to me and say, "Well, we need a permit for Joe Smith. He's coming out. We're going to keep mm -hmm. him supervised." And I say to you, "So, what was his offense?" Yep. So that's already happening. Uh, yes, they're allowed to, to share all that, okay, all so that that's, information. So that's notification of one for the, for, the, uh, for the landlord. Right, because that's going to be part of what DOC does in terms of their, you know, approving housing okay. right now. But they don't, uh, they don't necessarily talk to the neighbors. DOC does not necessarily talk to the neighbors. They're not it, required to. But it's still at their discretion. It's at their discretion, so they certainly may do that. Yeah, I mean, I've seen the results of them telling the neighbors and all, all, all everything breaks loose. Right, yeah, and, and that was, again, for those of y'all who've been here for a while, you probably remember, again, probably, you know, maybe about 10, 12 years ago, there were a number of situations in, um, where you wound up with uh, people who had maxed out and they kept trying to find housing in towns and as soon as they would know, they were notifying and then as soon as they would notify, then they would lose the housing and there were a few offenders there were they actually wound up policing out of state because um, by doing the notification it meant that they couldn't actually find any so if somebody the just one more thing to clear so if somebody maxes out mm -hmm. uh, they they can go anywhere they want yep because uh, they're no longer under supervision they still remain in the sex offender registry Yes, and they essential. are required to be updating their information any time so they so move. So yeah. if I, if I and it's a registry move. violation if you do not do that. So if I just max out, I can go about my about my way? Yes, you can. Yep. Without yep. notifying anybody. Well, you have to notify. I have to notify. You have to notify their registry, right. right? And then what the registry does is you're required to. So if you're under, if you're required to register, you have to notify the registry in any change of address. And then when the registry gets that information, then they transmit that to local law enforcement. So, so if I am currently living, if I'm on the registry, I'm on Montpelier, and I decide I'm going to move to Barrie, I have to let the registry know. Registry then contacts Barrie PD and lets them know mm -hmm. and says, you know, Michelle Childs, her offenses are these, this here's their information, she's now living in your town and not in Montpelier. So this looks pretty straightforward. However, should we agree to this, how much work do we undo from previous policies and procedures? I mean, I would say it is a pretty substantial policy change um, from where the legislature has been and what's on the books now. Um, as I mentioned, I think you know it was very important for all the folks. They they wanted the authority to do it, but they didn't want to be mandated because of you know again trying to balance the we're trying to reintegrate someone and protect the public at the same time and uh, depending on the person's risk um, you know, maybe maybe they meet these these uh, criteria but maybe they're actually low risk maybe they've completed sex offender treatment um, they're engaged in community treatments or circles of support all those kinds of things and maybe DOC thinks it's better for them not to do that and that the person may lose their housing and then you know not be able to be released if, if they did the notification so right now they can do it um, but they're not required to. And so DOC would have to let you know about what kind of additional burden that would be. I, I, in terms of how many 
people a year would qualify on the offenses against a minor who are being released from confinement. So, but they would they would know that because they have to keep track of all that stuff now. Thank you. Marcia? I know it works well. I have one in my area, and we'll go and live with his mom, and then he'll come back and live with his grandmother. And every time he moves around, they send me a, an email that he's back in the area. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and you can talk to, and again, if you decide to work on this, you can talk to DOC about what they do to be monitoring compliance with the registry. There's also uh, provisions in here about doing, about law enforcement doing checks. So that you'll sometimes hear in the news media or whatever that, like, one town, you know, like went out and they did registry checks over a particular weekend, you know, and they arrested 12 people for not keeping their, you know, not being where they said they were going to be according to the registry. Um, so they have the ability to do spot checks, things like that. Um, before says that if they were going somewhere and they thought there might be a problem to have a police officer go with them instead of them carrying guns. I think they do that. I think they do reach out to the local police department if there's issues. Carlo's not his That's correct. Yeah. <clears throat> he wouldn't do it every time, but for a particular case. Yeah. So what's the thinking on 8444? That's the one to carry a weapon. People want to work on this or not? I have a lot of interest. I'd rather not. Other folks? No. No? Other folks? What are we doing? <laughs> 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 do we have a lot of people who have weapons and be able to have a weapon. People on parole. I mean, people parole on should they have a weapon. And also be able to use use of force. <laughs> Oh, I'm hearing that. I'm just going to make a note. This is what I'm going to work on. Okay, it looks like we're not interested. Okay, 842. Eight, what are people thinking? I'm, uh, my thoughts are not to work on it. I don't want to put the mandate to the local police to have to do that sort of working. Not pretty when it happens. I've been through a community where this has happened. The person got run out of town. And his parents were in their mid 90s, early 90s, and they were willing to take him in. And they were ostracized by the family. Mm -hmm. The person ended up in Hardwick with their uh, administrative group, church group. Other folks? I'm not interested in that. I agree with what you just said strongly. I mean, they notify you now. So I don't know why we have to. Leave it up to the people that know what to do. Mm -hmm. And also, when Brian was in here, excuse me, this did not address this concern in that it was not a minor. The victim was not a minor. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you want a motion now? <laughs> Do we want a motion to do to? I would say no. I won't take a motion. No, sure. So we agreed to not work on H 842. So we've made that decision. Can we paint those two? <laughs> okay. All right. I'll see you all next year. Thank you. I'm going to kill you back. Okay.